Well, good morning. Um, it's good to get to talk to quite a few of you, and I've uh, been out a little bit, so I don't want to say there's garnered optimism out there. I think we know, uh, before I get involved here with the talk, but uh, what's going on. And there's certainly some concern, and what I've seen is some spotty damage, and from what I've talked to many superintendents, uh, that's what they're seeing in the field. And spotty damage on putting greens fairways somehow seem okay so far. Uh, which surprises me. I thought we'd see a lot more damage on fairways. The only thing I want to emphasize, and I think all the superintendents in the room know it, and they're very good at communicating this, that we're not out of the woods yet. And there's still a little concern. I remember even probably 15 years ago, I was at a course and superintendent was all concerned and I went out and looked at the greens. I said, you know, I think you're over-exaggerating. I don't think it's really that bad. I, 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 things look pretty... I, I think some of this pole is going to be okay. And two weeks later, it wasn't okay. <laughs> so a lot depends on we get these types of nights, especially once we start to really thaw out. We get some water flowing, or maybe the frost coming out of the ground, saturated soil conditions, and you get a single digit night, that's when everybody gets really worried. So let's keep our fingers crossed that we don't get any worse than spotty, um, and uh, we'll get a, a decent weather, decent spring recovery, and um, we're going to know more probably in the next 10 days, two weeks. We'll we'll get a better idea of, of what's ahead of us this summer as far as uh, cold temperature damage. So as Tom said, I'm talking a little bit, I'm going to switch gears really quick here, and going back into these tall grass roughs, you call them naturalized areas, uh, you, can, you can call them a lot of the hay, and there's a, there's a number of terms for these areas, and they can be a friend, they can be a foe. Um, here's a common one, our friends at Dedham probably know this one, it looks pretty familiar to you all. But this could be at any golf course in New England. Uh, just a natural mix of, of, of some native grasses. You can see the little blue stem in the center and some fescues on the edges. And you go to the Country Club or Braeburn or Essex or Salem, Fisher's Island. It's going to look pretty similar. These are an important component of the golf courses up in New England and across the country. And they do offer an opportunity to, they have some environmental benefits and they actually some design benefits as well. Uh, but if they're not properly placed and if they're not thought out well and there's really no regard to the maintenance of these areas, uh, they can be a foe, they can fail. And, and there's issues where they just don't work. So today I want to look at, look at these areas a little bit more, kind of identify some areas that can be considered natural areas. It's not always meadows and, and, and grassland areas. We'll look at that. Uh, we'll look at the placement of these, how we can make them beneficial. Look at some of the misconceptions. The fact that, you know, some of the maintenance misconceptions that we see with them. And uh, we'll look at some of the maintenance, and we'll try to do all that in about 30 minutes. So with that, I'm going to get, uh, get going. I said there are a lot of these types of areas. The first one I showed you was a mix. This is another one. I thought this was a real interesting one done at uh, a club in Connecticut where they took out about 75-80% of the trees. That was a dense stand of forest. And they did that to improve the growing environment, to open it up, get some airflow through, as Adam talked about, cool the environments down, get a little bit more sun, and then open up sight lines on fairways. And they replaced it with tall grass. And it's a savanna area. Not cutting, really reducing mowing inputs, and it worked out really well. A very common meadow prairie one, where you allow more of the forbs or more of the broadleaf plants to remain in those areas. It's more natural. And you'll see some uh, more diversity, a little bit more... Uh, interest, a little bit more color. Certainly not a spot that you're going to have in play. So you might see this further out from uh, from your center lines and in areas where, you know, if somebody does hit that stray shot, it's not too bad. A big naturalized area on the Cape and in the islands is really the scrublands. And scrublands are, can be a blended grasses, but typically they're going to be small oak trees and bayberries and a number of other plants that I don't know the ecology of the areas that well to get into specifically. You can see some goldenrod in there. Maybe not what you had in mind for a naturalized area, but that's what the ecology of that environment is. And definitely as valuable as just a, a plot of fescue, probably more so. Uh, but that's what you have. So um, an area that really makes up uh, a large part of a golf course. Wetland areas, often overlooked. They're regulated to a point where we have to maintain them in a natural state. But real important natural areas, and including the buffer strips that go around them and prevent any kind of movement, erosion, uh, maybe migration of chemicals into these areas. Um, and, and 
really uh, they start to cool the water, purify the water. There's a lot of good benefits and they can be bank stabilization and so forth. So wetland areas are an important part. And finally you move further north, uh, you start getting into New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, and even up in, in central New England, we've got woodland areas. And these probably get no attention. The only time they get attention is when we go in there to cut trees down and to thin them out for the benefits of the playing areas. You have cart paths running through woods. These have an opportunity to be a really sightly, very good looking area. I don't even know how to manage these that well to get that nice understory of ferns and, and so forth. But if you manage them properly, keep the invasives out, they can be a really attractive uh, component of a golf course that needs more attention. So these are some areas that we probably don't consider as natural areas. We tend more to focus on the tall grass roughs and so forth. So what are some of the benefits? Let's look at some of the conservation or environmental benefits. And I think what, uh, what Tom mentioned and, and kind of the theme of today is a lot of sustainability issues. And one way that courses try to become more sustainable is by developing more naturalized roughs in out of play areas. But the idea is that there'll be just fewer inputs. There is one way that we're going to do that, and that's with irrigation. These areas shouldn't be irrigated. They won't work well if they're irrigated. You'll have to fight more weeds and so forth. So if there's a, a need to take your water, reduce some of your water usage on a golf course, ideal place to do it. In some cases, mowing, the weekly mowing or more regular mowing practices are certainly going to be reduced. So you can knock your mowing inputs down quite a bit. But you're still going to have to mow them. It's a tool to manage these areas and to keep them playable and in good appearance. Maybe only mow them annually, maybe twice a year, but the mowing project is going to be much more labor intensive. Uh, so you're reducing the amount of uh, mowing that you're doing, probably some of the fuel inputs, uh, but I'm not sure if you're going to really reduce all the labor by the time you clean them up and so forth. Fertilizer chemical, absolutely. You shouldn't be putting fertilizer in them unless they're just being established. And there's an argument with the chemical that might or might not be depending on what level of maintenance or what uh, level of appearance, visual quality that these areas have to be kept to keep the golfers happy. So that's a same with the cost. It all depends on what the intensity of maintenance is. Uh, this could be one of the misconceptions though. People in, in when the economy turned, people went to more naturalized areas with the idea to reduce some of the maintenance inputs and costs. And as long as you go at it with that idea, that objective, that can be the case. Uh, but these areas evolve, and there's more and more pressure to make them more playable, to get rid of some of the uh, diversity of the plant material, to try to get them to more of a fescue mono stand. And when you do that, your costs go up. And again, an argument can be made that mowing it every 10 days, every week, every two weeks, and keeping it at your three to four to five inch height, uh, you're probably not going to have that many more inputs than if you try to maintain it in, uh, as a natural area. So it depends on what your idea of natural is and what you can get away with. The other environmental positives of these are the habitat that it creates, and they're just building soil. I mean, you're taking sunlight, you're getting carbon dioxide. That's great for those who are worried about some of the global warming issues or climate change, this carbon sequestration, but it's really just building the soil, organic matter. These areas do that. And by doing that, you're going to reduce some of the erosion and so forth. Um, I remember that flock of turkeys we had at Curtis Cup every morning. They'd greet you uh, just picking away at the seed heads, but a ton of deer and, and, and other uh, wildlife coming in. So uh, kind of a not, a not a bad way to go. Yeah. Jim, can I pause your phone? Hear it now. Um, so the other environmental benefits, just buffering uh, the wetland areas I talked about. This is a little... Uh, the stream up at Jay Peak, and I thought they did a great job with this riparian area of just stabilizing it. It's a big washout creek, and, and these areas do have some benefits that way. Now, there are other design benefits that you have to look at, too, and they do certainly can be used when they're placed properly. They're going to provide challenge without being overly penal. Um, Risk-reward factors, again, we take trees out on dog legs, things like that. Um, you can create a better risk-reward probably with some type of a bunker and even a tall grass area. Bite off what you can, but at least you give somebody the opportunity to go for it. These tall grass areas, these naturalized roughs, certainly offer that opportunity. Uh, the other thing they do is just offer some definition with some of the fairways and the finer cut, uh, finer maintained areas. Great contrast and what architects like the word texture. They certainly provide more texture to your property and just more interest 
and at least in the eye of the beholder to me I think aesthetically they can improve the look of a of a golf course in comparison to just everything being maintained at a three and a half inch or uh, whatever your primary rough cut is so these are some of the benefits now they can go bad as well and, and they can be a problem when they're not placed properly now this is a course that I work with uh, you'd certainly rather hit, the, hit something into that bunker than into the bunker bank next to it that situation on a daily fee course is a disaster it's going to impact your pace of play and it's just not going to be fun yeah, lost ball situation or uh, unplayable so not well set up and really that shouldn't even be there now you look into the left of the car path where there's a treat area it's further out of line why that isn't naturalized and the bunker bank is I don't know uh, but I think it's probably been changed since and you know no matter where you put them they are going to impact some golfers I mean you can be uh, can be 30 yards away from the center line of the fairway 40 yards away from the center line of the fairway uh, maybe 20 yards from the pri edge of the fairway and they're still going to find some golfers so you can't protect everybody uh, but with some common sense and, and know the areas to avoid uh, the magnets out there on the golf course it's a pretty good means to uh, you know you can you can reduce the impact on pace of play the other thing I wanted to talk about real quick here is the perception factor. Like I said, it's in the eye of the beholder. To me, that naturalized rough area is, is perfect. It's predominantly grass. It's fairly thin. But yet you do have some of the rabbit's foot clover in there. It might have some of the yellow flowers, the yellow rocket, and some yarrow or something. To me, that's fine. But I know if I asked a lot of golf, or maybe some of you in the room, that's not your perception of it. it to you, it might look unkept. And it's just a difference of opinion. Your idea of a naturalized rough might not be mine, and mine might not be yours. So you've got to know what your golfers want. And here's where the communication factor comes into play. Uh, if you can convince people, let them know why you're doing what you're doing, um, you know, why you're allowing the clover to stick in there. It's not really impacting play, or you're trying to attract pollinators or wildlife of some sort, then maybe they'll go for it. Uh, but sometimes it's hard to overcome that battle and um, I've been to golf courses where you see the pendulum you have a group of people that love it and then it sways back to a group of people that really don't like it and usually the mowing lines change based on who's in power here's another one again perfectly fine naturalized rough area it's a bunch of goldenrod and such uh, you'll find this in upstate New York in areas where you get a little bit heavier soils uh, but a lot of people will say my goodness why are you not maintaining that that looks terrible so those are things that you just have to work through some of the misconceptions and here's where we get in trouble with these areas that you go and play a golf course um, and maybe it's a brand new golf course and they've developed these naturalized rough areas as part of the new design maybe it's a different location than yours their sandier site a quarry site uh, really thin soils gravelly soils a mono stand of fescue spectacular it's wispy, it's thin, I can go find my golf ball and go get it. It doesn't look like these areas require a whole lot of maintenance. Well, unfortunately, that's usually that's not the case. Many golf courses want those conditions, but they don't realize what their site is. You might have better soils than that golf course did. You're probably on an old farm, nice rich loam. You can grow really healthy, thick grass. And that's not what you want in some of these naturalized areas. Now, you can do it. You can still develop these areas. But you really have to be cognizant of where you're going to locate them because they're going to be more dense. And they're probably going to <laughs> gather more attention as far as playability goes. And with that, you'll have an increase in maintenance. And the fact that they require minimal maintenance, fewer inputs, yes, they do. But it depends on the, how you want them to play and what the expectation levels of those areas are. That's ideal, right? Go get it. That might be fairly early spring. I can still get a club head on the golf ball. I'm not quite sure what it's going to do to my club head, but I can find it and play it. In reality, you're not going to find that. It's like a bunker. They're not always consistent. They're not going to be perfect in perfect condition. Uh, and that's a, a picture of some dewberry, which is one of the scourge weeds that we have to deal with up here in, in uh, New England. Um, that vine, there's some uh, you can you can just see uh, it, it's a tough situation. So where that golf ball is located in the lower part of that section, sure you can play it, but if you miss that by six inches, you're in trouble. And you know those are some of the problems. So 
there is going to be some maintenance, especially in more higher play areas. Um, they do need to be managed. That's the bottom line. We have to manage these areas to be successful. And if not, they quickly become unplayable. They quickly become unpopular. And uh, in some cases, it will cause the areas to go away. Uh, instead of correcting the situation, the, uh, uh, the option is to go and just cut them back down to primary roughs, which is a shame. It defeats the purpose. Uh, so do they have to be managed as intensively as a primary rough? Maybe not. Um, in some cases, they're going to require some unique management, and it's going to depend on where they're located and what their site are. Here's some money, just some, or some cost issues that we looked at. I had a survey for an article that I did, I don't know, five or six years ago, and I actually talked to a lot of superintendents somewhere in the room. And, uh, you know, on the average for labor, for the herbicides that we put out, for mowing, for thinning, uh, maybe some insecticides against some surface feeding insects and and, and such uh, is about $260 to $500 per acre. And that was quite a few years ago. So it's not just put the mowers away and let Mother Nature take care of it. There are going to be some costs associated with keeping these areas in acceptable condition. So where do these areas work and when are they effective? Well, when you know what you're trying to accomplish, what's the purpose? What's the objective of these areas? Is it to reduce inputs? Well, if it is, that's great. You can do that. But, you know, realize um, that they might not look perfect. They might not be that wispy mono stand of fescue that, that you see in the pictures blowing in the wind. Um, if they're sighted properly, you're going to get a lot less pressure, and uh, it'll, it'll work better uh, when impacts on play are, are limited. And when people realize that there will be some maintenance involved with them, there'll be some funding provided for it, you know, whether it's an herbicide application for the mowing situation, and, uh, and, and so forth. So where are these areas best suited for? I say <laughs> difficult to maintain sites. Steeper embankments, out of play areas, uh, areas that certainly can't be irrigated, uh, and environmentally sensitive areas, those buffer strips around stream banks, ponds, places that a lot of golfers don't like to see, uh, but bring the hazard line outside of the natural area, protect those areas. Those are give -me's. Those aren't, shouldn't even be controversial. Those are the easy ones. The difficult ones are the ones that might impact play a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe visually, they're more questionable. So uh, these are the best areas for uh, naturalized rough areas. This was a spot, and I think just the perfect uh, definition of a spot that was being maintained as a primary rough. And yeah, we could fix that. We could overseed it, aerify it, uh, maybe fertilize it a little bit more. Maybe run an irrigation head to it, make it playable. Or we could allow it to naturalize. Maybe overseed it once, get the right grass in there with some fescues, and just let it grow, keep the carts out of it. In doing that, you could reduce in some of the inputs, but you're also going to create a much better looking uh, spot, a little bit more interest than just primary rough, and not that close to the play line, so it should be acceptable that way. Um, an ideal site for, for developing a natural rough area. Not too much argument. Location is everything. Uh, this is a great par 3 at, at uh, Port Rush. I don't know if anybody's had the opportunity to play it. I don't remember if that was a 7 iron, probably about 130, 840 yards I carry. But pretty damn intimidating. And probably not the spot I'd want to start developing a naturalized uh, rough area on my golf course, at least initially. I wanted people to get used to these areas. So force carries are always a concern. And watch out for, of course, short right. Uh, you know, you don't want to bang up your highest handicap golfers. Make it challenging for the lowest handicap golfers, uh, but um, keep in mind who's playing the golf course and where the front tee boxes are and, uh, and where most of your golfers go. And then high cart traffics tend to get matted down, and they just don't work all that well. They're not that good to look at, so there's going to have to be some cart management, keeping, those, uh, keeping carts out of these areas. Um, or... Some of those cases, it's usually just better not to allow them to naturalize. Maintain them as primary rough. The grass will be better and it'll look better. You might be able to identify some potential areas. You know, we do it visually already. Uh, but with some of the new technology with these data loggers, and you're going to see these coming out for maintenance equipment, and it's a neat idea. Concept is to provide them to golfers. Find out where your golfers go. You might identify areas that are good spots for taking them out of play and reducing inputs. 
You can see on the left side of the screen uh, the red marks, and, and there's a spot to the left of the fairway. Um, that's probably already a natural area, but you can see there's very little traffic in there, and that might be just a great spot to really cut back on a lot of the inputs and allow, you know, allow it to naturalize, cut back the irrigation, and so forth. You look behind the green, uh, probably not a good idea to try to let the grasses grow up in that area. An awful lot of traffic going through there. It's going to slow up play and, and uh, beat that area up, so that looks to me like it could have been one area. It was naturalized at one point and probably would back off that and go back to mowing it. So... New technology is kind of a neat way to, to look at things and identify potential areas on a golf course. At least that, from a play standpoint, would be suitable. Uh, visually, that might be another question. Another ideal site, just a lousy... If you want to grow grass in Newfoundland, that's Newfoundland. When they call it the rock, it's the rock. Uh, you got a soil like that, good luck. Why would you even want to maintain something like that, right? I mean, it's just rough and coarse and, and uh, well, that's... Pretty well suited. You to, you're not going to get many arguments there for tall grassing yet. Uh, maintenance is, it, there's, there's just going to be maintenance needs, and, and location really dictates the maintenance, especially the soils and drainage. I mentioned it early. If you're a golf course that's growing out of decent soil, a loam soil, you're going to have pretty nice growing conditions for grass and, and even some of the other plant material. In a wet season, it's going to even be worse. So if you've got golfers coming uh, to the committee and to the superintendent and saying, gosh, we really love that fescue that we saw on TV this Sunday, and uh, how do we get that? Well, you're probably not going to get that. And to get to that point, it's going to take more work. And the placement of those areas will even be more critical because they're going to be more dense and less playable. Uh, so... Usually the wetter the areas are, the more plants you have to contend with, and the, probably the more weed management those areas are going to require. Uh, the proximity to play uh, obviously is important. And then just the visual quality. If I'm looking out this window, down number 18 fairway, and you've got tall grass areas, well, there's certainly more pressure to keep that looking at whatever the look is, uh, but you probably are not going to allow it to go too wild and it'll take a lot more control and a lot more inputs to maintain that type of an area. Uh, some of these uh, inputs, mowing, uh, it's going to be an annual practice. We'll see a spring cut sometimes put on these areas, uh, especially where you have better soils and we get a flush of spring growth and density is an issue. Quite often you go out fairly early spring after that first flush of growth before the grass starts putting up seed heads. Try to cut some of the areas back Get rid of some of that foliage, vegetative material, clean it out, and then let the second growth, like a second cutting of hay, come up. A little bit drier in June. You might not get as dense of a, of a, of a, of a mat. It'll be more playable. It's a little risky. Sometimes you cut it too late and you don't get seed heads forming. Um, but it's a, a, a tool that some of the people are using or some of the, uh, a lot of courses use, and it seems to work okay. Uh, but at least annually you cut them back, get rid of the vegetation. It's almost like a contra agronomy. You want to pull that vegetation out, especially with better soils, because we're trying to create a poverty condition. We want things sparse and thin. We don't want to fertilize. We don't want all that tissue to go back into the soil and, and, and feed the plant. So we're, we're trying to keep things on the thin side and, and more natural side that way. Flail mowers are big. That's the Wiedemann uh, 500. Um, flails are nice for rocky sites, and they can also be used to thin and maybe not cut down evenly. So this is uh, Fisher's Island in a fairly high play area. Um, a very pretty heavy soil, lower part of, a, of, of one of the fairways there. And they use the Wiedemann probably for two or three passes around the edges of some of those fairways where the tall grass can get too thick in a, in a, in a wet season without losing the, the look of the tall grass. So to them it's a valuable tool. Might be something to consider, but mowing's a, a real important part of it. And mowing can be used to really dictate what grasses grow. If uh, you've got prairie grasses, native grasses, and you're trying to get those things really established, or you're a pretty busy golf course, and um, maybe you want the place to really shine in August, September, and you've got little blue stem, this might be a way to do it. Cut for a good part of the spring, um, and then when summer comes, you let some of these native grasses take off, and they will look good in September, and this will not be the same golf course uh, that you see um, in June and May is what you'll see in August and September. Uh, so mowing can be a, a real important tool for that. Controlled burns, we don't see it very often, but there are a handful of courses in New England that do use fire as a management tool. 
And fire is a lot like mowing, and it's going to burn up that vegetation, that material, so it's not going to return it to the soil. Uh, you will get some mineral return. Uh, it'll kill weed seeds, it will kill some woodies, and it will uh, get rid of a lot of insects. Not practical for a lot of golf courses. You better have a good fire marshal that, uh, that will work with you uh, to do it. Talked about animals and grazing. And is it a fad or is it a, is it a tool? I think it's kind of a neat tool. And the um, fact is, it's a service now, and, and you can get the animals brought in. And I know Cohasset's using them fairly readily. Glenn is, and they'd probably be the, the people to talk to in regards to the details behind this. Uh, but kind of a neat way to go to maintain some of the invasives, as you said, some of the stuff that other animals don't want to mess with or that would require some herbicide, difficult herbicide applications. You can let, let the goats have at it. They will eat mothiflora rose. They will eat poison ivy. Um, and... Keep those areas down. It's probably, again, not for everybody, uh, but if uh, you have expansive native areas, naturalized areas, and you have really rough terrain, rock outcroppings, you can't get mowers on everything, it might be kind of a neat fit for you. So it would be kind of interesting to, to look at it. Uh, some of the herbicide management, all I could say there is broad scale applications are, are targeted, and you're going to probably do both. And it depends on where they're located and, and what's expected. Hopefully, not all areas are going to be treated the same, and you can get away maybe with a broad spectrum to begin with, and then focus more on spot treatment of, of specific plants that are not wanted in those areas. Uh, just a lot of hand treatment applications, kind of minimize the, uh, some of the inputs there. So it just depends on what your goals are and what you're aiming at. And finally, not all areas do require the same amount of maintenance, and this is where you can control your inputs to a degree. Areas closer to play that are more visually prominent are going to receive the most inputs with herbicides, with mowing, and so forth. As you move away from those sight lines and you move away from the play, hopefully you can back off and allow more diversity and, and maybe not have to go at it so hard with some of the weeds and, and so forth, more spot treatment. And this is just a situation of Fisher's Island. You can kind of see that. There's a primary cut, almost like a, 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 a big step cut there that's about four to six inches. And then you go into a fescue, which is the light color, and then you get into the more native material. So they graduate it out. The further from play, the thicker, the gnarlier, the more nasty, the more natural it gets. And by doing that, they've, they found a way that they can reduce their maintenance inputs, and, and people will accept it, and, and they actually like it. and It's playable. So these areas can be mostly natural, and they're planned right, and they have a purpose. If your purpose is to reduce inputs, then realize that they're not going to be wispy fescue in most cases. They're going to have a diversity, a lot more plant material. It's important to tell people what you're doing, what you're trying to accomplish. And if you can do that, people have an idea of what you're after, they're more accepting and more willing. And as I always tell a lot of clubs that I work with and people who are interested in it, start small. Don't overwhelm people. Let them get used to it. Let them get it then you can take them to the next level. And you'll be a better manager. You'll figure out what weed, what mowing, uh, what, what specific inputs you have to do to make them look good and, and to accomplish whatever objectives you're trying to accomplish with those areas. And then finally, be realistic and flexible with the maintenance. <laughs> and by flexible, I mean if people really don't like them, cut them down. It's very easy. It's not that costly. Try them. Give them a shot. You can always back off. Mowing lines can change through the season, and they will. Don't get frustrated. So with that, I'll leave you with a pretty picture of Gullen, and uh, hopefully our golf courses will be looking like that fairly soon. And um, with that, I'm just going to turn it over, uh, or if there's any questions, real quick. Besides so killing the deer, is there anything you can <laughs> do for uh, tick management? Um, well, I didn't get into that, but... That's one of the inputs you're seeing with the tall grass roughs. Or some people are starting to put out two or three insecticide sprays to keep the ticks down. But yeah, keeping the deer out and the mice are the other problem. So, you know, the best, best thing you can do is really educate the golfers on it and look at some of the tick, some of the treated clothes that work extremely well. They've got treated socks, they've got pants. Um, and with permethrins, and these work very well for keeping ticks off of people. And the other thing with the ticks is people think that 
they're in the tall grass roughs, and they are. But they're also in the primary roughs, and you can pick them up even in your yard. But where people find most of the ticks are the edge habitat. So it's where the tall grass roughs get into the woods. They like a little bit more shade, a little bit more moisture. You get out into these open grass areas quite often, it's just too hot for them. Having said that, I've picked them up. I know they're there. So it's a, it is definitely a concern. Any others? Oh, one more. Jim, uh, do you have any, does the USGA green section have any info on uh, varieties of uh, different, like sheep rescues or hot rescues in those situations? Like, uh, the picture of the savanna is pretty nice. I'm looking to do some of that stuff right now. Um, or do you just send us to the end test? No, nah, it's not, you know, you, you could do an NTEP thing, but actually you can buy a collagen mixes. And what I normally recommend, it depends again what you're trying to get, but I'll usually recommend just a blend of hard fescue and maybe a blend of hard and sheep's fescue. If you just want the fescue look and some of the ecology mixes will have some of the little blue stem in there. They might have some of the other grasses, which are a bit thicker, a bit more dense, which you cite for more out of play areas. That savanna, that grassland area, that would just be a blend of fescues to me. I, you could put a small amount of ryegrass in, which they did, uh, even some annual ryegrass with it if you want it as a nurse. Uh, but hard fescue will be, will be pretty neat, and um, a little bit some sheep's fescue, and the seed heads will come up at a little bit different times, so it won't all just wash out at the same time, and I think it'll give you what you're looking for. All right, thank you very much.